Okay, so uh, I'd like to talk about a specific period. As you can read, six years of Caravaggio's life uh, and what was the situation in Rome at that time. Um, as we said, uh, the situation all over the world is not extremely easy at the moment. The pandemic and uh, economic problems and unemployment and so on. We hear this all the time on TV. Uh, a similar situation occurred also in Italy uh, and in Europe at the time of Caravaggio, uh, between the end of the 1500s and the beginning of the 1600s, uh, turmoil was spread a little bit all over Europe. Of course, not only in Italy, with, in particular with Catholics and Protestants fighting and killing each other. Um, Queen Elizabeth, for example, in England, decided to behead her cousin, Mary Stuart, in 1587. In the same period in Rome, so just to come closer, uh, Beatrice Cenci was beheaded uh, for having killed her father. And this was right at the end of the century, in 1599. Uh, she was a rape victim who decided to react against the arrogance, the violence, uh, and the rude attitude of her father. Uh, in this situation, a painter called Michelangelo Merisi, born in Milan in 1571, arrived in Rome and he became soon maybe the best uh, <coughs> artist who could interpret the chaos and the contradictions of this troubled period. It was very clear for the intelligentsia of the Catholics that not only a new century, uh, but a new era was about to start. Uh, just to take one example, Cardinal Paleotti in those years wrote uh, a splendid uh, pamphlet, a treaty, the discourse on sacred and profane images, that would be a guide, a help for many, many artists uh, in choosing the appropriate way to tell stories. The image that you see by Caravaggio, Judith beheading all of Hermes in the Barberini Palace is an example of it. Uh, a very, very strong impact and very easy understanding for everybody, from the intellectuals uh, and for common people. The book by Paleotti was not a, a kind of obligation was not a cage. It was essentially really a help. Uh, and that's a very good example because in this uh, particular example, Caravaggio was free about how to depict Judith, the sword that she's using, the way she was dressed. But the, the style was always left to the specific painter, to the specific artist. Uh, this was um, what the, what the uh, theologians called muta predicatio, silent prayer. Uh, somehow they could go deeper in religion and also in psychology with the help, with the book. Uh, something similar happened also many, many centuries before in the Paleo-Christian period. Uh, because in the catacombs, uh, they, there was a kind of codified system of images telling in an easy way, uh, in a very clear way, uh, how to tell stories and how to stimulate people to prayer. Caravaggio followed this, um, this kind of line, this kind of thread. He had a natural talent in telling stories. And uh, this image with a strong impact shows it very well. 
uh, and here also a special gift, the capacity to talk to common people and to intellectuals at the same time. Just like Shakespeare who was born only seven years before Caravaggio. Um, his birthplace, Milan, and the region, Lombardy, uh, they had already been focused on uh, realism in painting for more than a century. These images are images uh, of several paintings and several artists, the Campi, the ones you can see now, but also Moretto, Savoldo, Moroni, all from the, the same artistic milieu of Caravaggio. Uh, but especially for Cardinal Paleotti and many others, the most incredible and perfect example were the Carracci, in particular Annibale Carracci. And he was really considered as the best incarnation of artists at the time, the very end of the 1500s. Um, if we enter the city wall of Rome, because all of this was essentially outside of Rome, with the exception of Judith and Holofernes, uh, if we enter the walls of Rome from the main gate, Porta del Popolo, People's Gate, we can see how this becomes uh, evident and real in the churches of the Eternal City. Piazza del Popolo has three splendid churches. You can see two in this image. And the most important church is Santa Maria del Popolo, St. Mary of the People. A church with a name that cannot be just a coincidence. Piazza del Popolo, People Square, Santa Maria del Popolo, St. Mary of the People. A way to protect and welcome people from all over the world, pilgrims in the past all kinds of people today walking into the city wall, walking into the city center. Inside this splendid church, among many masterpieces by Raphael, for example, or by Bernini, is a chapel, the one you see now, the Cerasi Chapel, uh, bought by Tiberio Cerasi as a burial place for his parents and for him in the beginning of the century, in 1600. Tiberio Cerasi was the commander in charge of all the administration of the patrimony of the church and the one of the Pope also, Pope Clement VIII. And he hired three remarkable artists uh, taking care of his chapel. Architect Carlo Maderno, who was the one responsible for the uh, for the construction, for the remodeling of the chapel. Uh, and he would soon start also his work as uh, the papal architect rebuilding the facade of St. Peter's Basilica. He called also Annibale Carracci for the painting you see in the center, the Assumption of Mary on the altar, and uh, Caravaggio to paint the side paintings the crucifixion of Peter on the left and the conversion of St. Paul on the right. Following the tradition established by Michelangelo uh, in the frescoes in the Vatican, the image of St. Peter was, to be, was supposed to be on the right and the one of Paul on the left. Uh, but, uh, and there were required both Caravaggio and Carracci to work on panels, not on canvas. And this is quite unusual, but there was a reason for that. Uh, the location of the church and the location of the chapel in the church is in a special place, is in a quite difficult situation because it's very humid. So paint on panels, cypress panels, and cypress is very rich in resin, would avoid uh, woodworms and mold. Uh, 
for Caravaggio, this was a real challenge because he had never painted on wood before. Not only, but there was also another problem. Uh, Cerasi asked Caravaggio to show draw drawings of what he was going to paint. To know that he was spending some money for something that he really liked. And maybe this is um, just a, a coincidence, but as far as we know, nobody could ever find a single sketch made by Caravaggio for one of his paintings. We have many sketches by Caravaggio, but they were not made for a specific canvas for a specific painting he was working on at that time. And finally, there was another problem because Maderno was still remodeling the chapel when Caravaggio and Carracci were painting their masterpieces. So how could Caravaggio decide about uh, the size of these canvases uh, or the location, the position of his canvases. He didn't know how large the chapel would be, how long the walls would be, if there was a window or maybe more than one window. For him, it was very, very difficult to work. But since in the contract, he had limited time to paint, eight months, uh, he painted the, the crucifixion of Peter and the conversion of St. Paul very quickly. Now, the next image is completely different. The first one, the one you see, is the one you can see in reality when you walk inside Santa Maria del Popolo. This is instead an impossible image in the sense that here we see a reconstruction, only a virtual reconstruction, with the assumption of Mary in the center by Carracci, the conversion of St. Paul on the left, and the crucifixion of Peter on the right, following exactly the position for the two uh, apostles, Paul and Peter, according to Michelangelo's frescoes. Uh, when Caravaggio went to see the chapel after the work of the architect was finished, he realized that there was there were actually two main problems. With Peter on the right, uh, he would not look at the assumption, not at all. And in particular, he could not look at the altar here, the center of the chapel, the place where mass would be celebrated. He couldn't see the Eucharist. With Paul on the left, with the conversion of Paul on the left, there was another problem because uh, the legs and the feet of Paul would be towards the altar with the assumption of Mary. And he wouldn't see anything because his eyes are covered. So he realized that actually he had to paint something completely different, completely different the image that I showed you before. Mm -hmm. This means that Caravaggio painted actually four pictures for the chapel. Today, we only have three left. We have the conversion of St. Paul. We have the other two images of the other picture, but we don't have this one any longer, the crucifixion of Peter. The one that you see here is actually a later copy made very likely 50 or 60 years after Caravaggio's death and identified by Marini not long ago in a convent in Sevilla in Spain. What we see if you go to the church is the image that I showed you before. So this one. And it's very, very easy to understand the difference, in particular in the colors. The colors used by Carracci in the center are the colors of divine world. In order to paint blue, 
Karachi used lapis. You see this on the mantle of Virgin Mary. You see this on uh, St. Peter's dress. In order to paint instead blue or green also, that you see better now, blue or green, Caravaggio used copper. And this was not to save money. Of course, lapis is more expensive than copper. It was essentially a manifesto, a deliberate choice, specific choice of Caravaggio. What is divine is different from what is human. And here the colors by Caravaggio are human colors. There's no divine color. There was also another incredible acquisition, another incredible success of Caravaggio. Uh, since the walls, so side walls for Peter and Paul are not very large and the chapel is almost claustrophobic, very, very small and shaped like a cube. It was impossible to tell a story horizontally. So he chose a new way, tell the story of the crucifixion of Peter following a diagonal line. See, and for the story of St. Paul, for the conversion of St. Paul, tell the story horizontally. Space is limited in the chapel. Physical space is very limited in the chapel. But Caravaggio had the incredible intuition that with this art, with this uh, double creation or recreation of uh, reality, he could do, totally change the physical limits of the chapel. This way, he was also able to do something absolutely unique. If I go back for a moment to the image of the chapel today, you can see that Peter is looking at the host, at the altar. So in the moment of his death, this is the rescue, the spiritual rescue for Peter. And that's why uh, somehow, even if everything is like falling down from his feet to his head, there's no sense of tragedy. There's no sense of pain, in particular, no pain at all on his face. There's no blood from his hand. And that's very different, completely different from the blood we saw in the image of Judith and Holofernes before. Um, today, we only have three paintings left by Caravaggio. These two on canvas, Caravaggio painted on wood the first two versions, the ones he didn't like, but the crucifixion of Peter is lost. And in between, we have the beautiful, ineffable image of the Assumption by Annibale Carracci. Uh, the focus, of course, tonight is Caravaggio, but it's impossible to forget what is in between. Not only because we respect, of course, another artist like Annibale Carracci, but in particular because this painting was the painting chosen by, Carra by Cerasi, sorry, for the altar. And because Caravaggio wanted to create a special link, a special connection between his two side paintings and the one in the center. There's interaction in the paintings. And actually Caravaggio was the first one who was able to create interaction between the paintings in the same space and interaction between the viewer and the painting. The very first time in history. And it's not by chance that a, a genius of theater, if I may say, uh, called Gian Lorenzo Bernini, about 50 years later, would consider the interaction of the three paintings in this chapel in order to create his masterpiece in the Cornaro, chapel in Santa Maria della Vittoria, also in Rome. 
Not only, but if we also uh, remember what Paleotti wrote in his book, in his treaty, which is to tell stories in a very, very easy way, in a way that could be easily understood by all people, regardless of their education status. Uh, we really understand that in the paintings by Caravaggio, everything is easy. Uh, for the conversion of St. Paul, for example, his eyes are closed because that's what's written in the gospel. In the first version, Caravaggio uh, painted St. Paul with his eyes covered. He has his hands on the eyes. In the first version, Caravaggio also painted Christ. And this is a poetic license, an artistic license, because in the gospel, there's no mention of Christ. Here, there's no image of Christ. The image of Christ is a metaphor, light. And Paul has his eyes closed. This is a very, very important um, element that will come back later with another image by Caravaggio. Why? Because when an important change comes in our life, uh, maybe we can feel the change. We can understand what's going on better within ourselves if we give up our rationality, if we close our eyes. It is something very, very baroque, but that's the time. Um, as Gabriella said, I was born in Rome. I've lived in Rome almost, almost all my life. Uh, and maybe my first acquis or one of my first acquisitions when I was a student, uh, many, many years ago, a century ago, uh, was that Baroque painting studied in Rome thanks to a spe special um, coincidence. Annibale Carracci, Caravaggio, and Rubens were all in Rome at the same time. And they were all working together in the same places. The Cerasi Chapel is one of those places. What's even more unique is that in Rome, we are extremely lucky even today, we don't care about the lockdown, uh, because we still have their master, many of their masterpieces still in the same locations where Rubens where Caravaggio or Caracci decided their masterpieces to be, in churches, in public places, in a place that Cardinal Borromeo or Paleotti would love, because it was a place where everybody could go and see the images of the saints and the holy stories. Uh, this uh, way of telling stories in a simple way, in a way that could be easy, easily understood by everybody, is extremely important if we think that the church, where the chapel, where the paintings are, is a church uh, owned by the Augustinians. And for the Augustinians, grace is extremely important. And grace is what we see in the conversion of St. Paul. The moment when his life, his heart, Everything changes thanks to the grace of the Lord. Uh, this was also the place, Santa Maria del Popolo, Campo Mazio, a district where Caravaggio lived, a district where Caravaggio worked, where there were many, many uh, prostitutes, uh, idlers, uh, people of all kinds. By walking into a church, when they saw the image of common people, 30 feet, earth, old people, they would easily, very, very easily uh, understand that these people were not too far away from them. Here, for the crucifixion of Peter, Caravaggio uh, hired uh, both men working in the river. And it's not today we talk a lot about the dirty feet or the physical effort. But this is absolutely logic. Why would somebody, a worker, be dressed in an elegant way or wear shoes at the time of St. Peter? 
at the time of Christ or at the time of Caravaggio. Uh, just going back quickly to Carracci, he was about 10 years older than Caravaggio, but he came to Rome a little bit later after Caravaggio. Uh, he came from Bologna. His uh, painting is completely different, as you see, because we said this is a painting showing divine, showing a miracle. This painting is about air. Virgin Mary is being lifted up, but she's extremely uh, energetic. She is also almost sculptorial, a way of painting that he, of course, learned and saw from Michelangelo, from the art of Michelangelo, for example, in the Sistine Chapel. Uh, in the typical Venetian style, colors are absolutely necessary in order to create the bodies. But since, remember, the chapel is extremely small, here Karachi went very, very far away. Virgin Mary is not only going up, up in the sky, She's also somehow jumping out of the canvas. And in particular, her foot is breaking the flat surface of the panel. And the hands, in particular this one, St. Peter's hand, is coming towards the visitor. Uh, these were called in the ancient uh, documents, mani eloquenti talking hands, talking to people, talking to common people. Uh, in addition to this, there's also, of course, the typical solid geometry by Raphael. So Virgin Mary, St. Peter, St. Paul, they form a pyramid, like in the transfiguration of Raphael. There's another church also owned uh, by the Augustinians where Caravaggio left another masterpiece. The Church of St. Augustine, very, very close to a place where Caravaggio for a certain amount of time lived. And what we see is the image of Our Lady of the Pilgrims. Uh, the canvas of this chapel uh, can be really considered a memento because the ones in the, uh, in the other church, in Santa Maria del Popolo, were made for a much, much more uh, universal uh, enjoyment. This was made, this was commissioned by Hermete Cavalletti, uh, a notary in the Vatican, who was very, very touched, almost by the end of his life, uh, during a pilgrimage to Loreto, to the sanctuary of Loreto, where traditionally the house of Mary was, the house where Jesus lived as a child with the rest of his family. Um, this canvas was um, made for a chapel owned by uh, Ermete Cavalletti, even though the canvas was finished after, after Cavalletti's death. It was paid by his wife. And what we see is essentially the moment of the prayer of two pilgrims, very likely the man is Ermete, Cavalletti, and the woman next to him is his mother. They are praying in front of Virgin Mary and Jesus. Now, usually when we have a painting of the house of the Loreto or the Virgin of Loreto, what we see is basically the house. And here instead, we see mostly an empty space we only get to see the doorway of the house, a very, very ordinary house. You can see some bricks. Plaster has fallen down from the wall, so nothing special. We can see a step where Virgin Mary is. But what we see is just a common place. Uh, when this painting was uh, presented, was shown for the first time in the chapel, uh, Baglione wrote, Baglione, Giovanni Baglione was a rival and also a friend in the beginning of Caravaggio, 
Baglione wrote that there was a lot of schiamazzo. Schiamazzo is an Italian word to say that people were cackling. Not a noise, not a human noise, but more the noise of uh, ducks, geese. The schiamazzo, this kind of noise, this kind of offensive noise or reaction, uh, shows again ostracism or difficult, uh, difficult way to understand Caravaggio's thinking. Uh, they say that the first thing that people would see when they were in front of the painting were again the dirty feet of the pilgrim. Uh, what, the, what the real problem was, was not about the dirty feet. The real problem that soon became actually the bonus of this painting was the presence of the pilgrims on the altar. Because the pilgrims are on the foreground, Virgin Mary and Jesus are almost like, in particular, Virgin Mary. She's almost like fading away, in particular, her dress. The dress of Mary here was painted by Caravaggio in Nazareth, not Lapis, like the one by Annibale Carracci in the other church. And this paint is extremely thick. It's mixed up with black and thick oil. Uh, just like in the crucifixion of Peter, uh, the story follows a diagonal line. So it starts from here, from the foot of the pilgrim. It continues in his body, his hands. His hands are almost touching Jesus' foot. And then the line continues to the opposite side of the canvas. The problem here and the schiamazzo, the noise, people cackling and people protesting, was not about the dirty feet. The problem was not that Virgin Mary is crossing her legs like an ordinary person. The problem was not even that the face of Mary is actually the face of Lena, Magdalena, a prostitute, a prostitute who was very, very often painted by Caravaggio in several works. The problem here were the pilgrims, the pilgrims on the altar of a church. Now, our idea of pilgrims today is completely different from the ideas of pilgrims back then. Giordano Bruno, who was um, burned alive for heresy, uh, only three years before this painting was made, when he talked about pilgrims in one of his books, uh, he mentioned pilgrims and said that they were useless people, always ready for robbery. It's the first time that pilgrims are on the canvas, on the altar of a church. Um, the image of Mary and the pilgrims, or the Holy House of Loreto, is completely humanistic. Human and humanistic, which explains also the colors, which explains also why there's no uh, lapis. There's another comparison that we can uh, establish, we can make between a Caravaggio's painting and, again, Annibale Carracci who painted uh, the house of Loreto for a church in Rome with the help, the very, very important help of several uh, students. And you can see that the image is absolutely ocean away from the one painted by Caravaggio. Sometimes, since we uh, know that Caravaggio was able to talk to all kinds of people, the crossing legs of Virgin Mary, I go back for a moment, would just be a popular touch, a popular note, a woman who is resting. Of course, that's more than possible, but 
also something else is possible. We know very well that when Caravaggio was uh, living in the palace uh, owned by the Medici family with Cardinal del Monte, in the collection of the Medici and in the palace where he lived, there was a statue, the one called Tusnelda, identified by Maurizio Calvesi, which is the statue of a, of a slave of Roman imperial age. Uh, when Virgin Mary uh, answered to the angel at the moment of the Annunciation, she said, here I am, I am the handmaid of the Lord. But in the Greek version uh, of the gospel, the most ancient, uh, she said exactly, I am the slave of the Lord. And the Tusnelda is the statue of a slave. Uh, these are the ears of the very, very, uh, of very successful works by Caravaggio, including the entombment of Jesus, once in the church of Santa Maria della Vallicella, later confiscated by Napoleon, so brought to Paris, and then returned in 1821, uh, thanks to Antonio Canova, and now this painting, this Splendid painting is in the painting gallery of the Vatican Museums. And here we see another incredible example of how Caravaggio was able to isolate one single monument moment of the action, like one photograph of the action, and freeze it in a single image, somehow anticipating photography. In these very successful years, uh, until 1606, from the beginning of the century until 1606, Caravaggio was somehow always living in Campo Marzio, so in the city center of Rome. All the paintings that I showed you from the churches, St. Mary of the People and St. Augustine, are in Campo Marzio. And his name in the police stations of Campo Marzio is recorded many, many times. We know that in about eight years, uh, Caravaggio was arrested uh, several times. Uh, brawl, libel, assault, jewels, many, many things. Now, to understand why Caravaggio was behaving this way, we have to consider at least two facts. The first one is about Rome. Uh, Rome, like other cities back then, uh, was a place, we're talking about 400 years ago, was a place where violence, crime, um, social unrest was a normal fact. In the beginning, I mentioned Beatrice Cenci, who was beheaded uh, in 1599 in front of Castel Sant'Angelo, next to the Vatican, close to the Vatican when she was 22, and together her stepmother, her brother, and two more people were killed in the name of justice. After years of violence, incest, sadic behavior, uh, segregation, all coming from her father, Francesco Cenci. We don't know if Caravaggio really was uh, at Castel Sant'Angelo when Beatrice Cenci was beheaded. So we don't know if he saw the execution of Beatrice, but the painting of Judith beheading all of fairness, the violence, the blood, the cruelty, they are really uh, the consequences of that period. There was also another important element to consider why Caravaggio behaved uh, a certain way. Why was he so often involved in crime or in trouble? And it's about the perception he had about himself. Caravaggio was born in a family with a certain reputation uh, under the patronage of the Colonna family, in particular Costanza Colonna, who was the Marquise of Caravaggio. Uh, 
she was somehow like a, a guardian angel and a stepmother for Caravaggio. Caravaggio then um, had no inclination for diplomacy. Uh, and when he was in Rome, he had very, very important connections. If we think of the names of the first um, patrons of Caravaggio, we find names like Del Monte, Giustiniani, um, Barberini, Colonna, Borghese. Uh, there was a day that totally changed Caravaggio's life and maybe art history. And it's May the 28th, 1606. Uh, for years, I also because I was born in May, uh, for years I have been trying to recreate what was the atmosphere of that day. It was a Sunday. Uh, it was almost the beginning of the summer, the end of May. But more than summertime, somehow there was um, in the air like a stormy perception of winter time. Uh, in the streets, there were thousands of people, thousands of people celebrating uh, the one year anniversary of the election of Pope Borghese, Paul V. He was elected only one year before, but uh, in one year, many, many things had totally changed. With the election of Pope Borghese, that's his portrait by Caravaggio, there was an immediate change in politics. The Republic of Venice didn't tolerate any longer the control of the Vatican over the clergy in Venice. Um, the doji were afraid that the interference of Rome would somehow also control finances, taxes in Venice. Uh, at a certain point uh, in April, two priests in Venice, uh, Saraceni and Guandolin, were arrested for crimes. The Pope, this Pope, Paul V, uh, said in a very, very strong way that the only court responsible for the judgment was the court of the Vatican, the court of Rome. The doji had very, very different ideas. Uh, the tension was in the air. And uh, at a certain point, Pope Paul V issued an interdict, an excommunication against Venice. Practically, war was ready. Not only a war between Rome and Venice, but a war that would involve almost all European countries, because France was ready to help Venice. England was also ready to help Venice. And even the Ottomans would be ready uh, to help Venice. On the other side, Spain uh, was ready to give support to the Pope, to the Vatican, with massive military forces. Finally, war didn't really uh, break out this time. But only 12 years later, uh, Ro uh, Italy would be, uh, sorry, Europe would be ravaged by the Thirty Years' War, involving almost all European countries. What we see in this painting by Caravaggio, painted only using two colors, white and red, is the image of a very, very firm Pope with a strong, very strong expression on his face, ready to stand and somehow anticipating the portrait of Innocence the Tenth by Velázquez, painted about 40 years later. So there was a sense of turbulence, a sense of uncomfort in the air in those days. And there were factions, the French-Venetian faction and the Vatican 
Spanish faction. Caravaggio was born uh, in Milan, but his family was from Caravaggio, and Caravaggio is a small village close to Bergamo, in the territory of Venice. Caravaggio was very, very often protected and helped by the French ambassador. So Caravaggio was definitely on the Venetian, French, Medici side. He had a, an enemy, among others, Ranuccio Tomassoni. Ranuccio Tomassoni was instead one of the members of sympathizing for the other faction, the Spanish one. Uh, there were many, many reasons why Ranuccio Tomassoni and Caravaggio wouldn't like each other. They have been knowing each other for a long time and arguing each other for a long time. Uh, money owed to brothels, to restaurants, or gambling. That day, 28th of May, 1606, they met to play Palacorda. Palacorda was something similar to ancient tennis. And this was again in Campo Marzio, two minutes walk from St. Augustine. At that time, we're talking about 400 years ago, uh, in Palacorda or a tennis court field, there would be no lines. So it was very difficult to uh, understand if there was fair play or false. Finally, during the game, Caravaggio killed Ranuccio Tomassoni. Of course, Caravaggio had to escape. There was no other chance for him. He finds protection, thanks again, another time, to the Colonna, in particular, Marquis Costanza Colonna. He goes to the palace of the Colonna downtown. Caravaggio got wounded in the fight. Uh, he stayed there for about two or three days, time necessary to be out of danger. And then, of course, Costanza Colonna couldn't hide Caravaggio for too long hiding that in particular from papal justice, for carrying weapons uh, illegally, for murder, Caravaggio had to appear before a court and very likely be sentenced to death. The last four years of his life uh, are a never ending escape from one place to another one, like a crazy running and falling. From June, 1606 until October, Caravaggio remains in Paliano, a village with the, the palace protecting uh, him, palace, Colonna Palace protecting him. And this image is uh, one of the two canvases painted by him when he was a fugitive man in the Colonna Palace. Uh, in this moment, Caravaggio has no energy left. He's tired. He feels sick. He's wounded in his body, but in particular in his uh, soul. He wants, he needs silence, peace, just like Magdalene here. In the shady and large rooms of the Colonna Palace uh, in Pagliano, this ecstasy was painted by him, a beautiful painting that is now in a private collection in Rome. It's difficult to, to think of another work by Caravaggio that expresses more silence, peace, rest, ataraxi, than the one you see here. Magdalene is resting in a cave, or maybe in a Roman gate, grave. Uh, nothing needs to be said any longer the space only for divine ecstasy notice the emptiness in the background there's nothing absolutely nothing like his last works in sicily painted at the very very end of his life it's only time to abandon your defenses and accept the grace of the lord her eyes are closed just like the eyes of St. Paul in the conversion that he painted about five years before. 
also because these eyes, even if they were open, they wouldn't see, they wouldn't understand the mystical experience that is happening in Magdalene and in Caravaggio. It's just time for acceptance. Like in the ecstasy of St. Teresa by Bernini, carved about 45 years later, but inspired by the ecstasy of Magdalene by Caravaggio. It's strange, but the canvas of Mary Magdalene in ecstasy was rediscovered only about 20 years ago. There was no evidence of this canvas until roughly the end of the last millennium. But there was a lot of talking instead about the eight copies, at least eight copies made by the original canvas by Caravaggio, including the splendid one, the splendid one by Louis Sanson that is now in the Musée de Beaux-Arts in Marseille. Sometimes people forget about the original work and we talk a lot about the copies, the later versions, the imitations. But this is finally the work of art history. Uh, only a couple of years ago, there were rumors about another Caravaggio discovered in France. We still don't know. It's again, Judith beheading Holofernes. There's a lot of controversy about the painting, but that's finally the work of art history. Future still needs to be written, and I'm sure there will be many other surprises on Caravaggio in the next years. Thank you. Grazie mille. Thank you, Paolo. Um, if you, yeah, if you unshare now so that we can open more, that's, let's see if we can. Um, <clears throat> 